The Incredibly Dead Pets of Rex Dexter. Chapter 13. I am surrounded by skeptics, but I have the boldness that comes with surviving a near-death experience at the hands of faulty school furniture, the stride of a mature and responsible person taking control of his destiny. The doubters trail me, adrift in the wake of my moxie. Slow down, buddy, complains Drumstick. Your confidence rides make me tired. I have little legs. Why are you even here, I ask him. You asked me to come, says Darvish. You called me your backup. I'm not talking to you, I clarify. I'm talking to the chicken. I can't hear the chicken, says Darvish. That's right. This is going to take some getting used to. Sorry, I forgot. I want to see what happens, says Drumstick. Plus, I love you. I have to confess, this bird is starting to melt through my hard candy shell. Soon, my nougaty soft center will be exposed to the heartbreaks and disappointments of this cruel world. I'm not sure how I feel about that. Once the Reaper's curse is lifted, he'll be on his way. Perhaps that's for the best. I stiffen my resolve and march on. The air smells of purpose and strawberries. Darvish is eating all the strawberries. I do not know where he got them. All I know is that strawberries are a light-hearted fruit, far too light-hearted for the serious mission at hand. He should be snacking on kiwi, if anything. That's a fruit that says, I mean business. All the usual suspects are hanging out at Bye Bye Plaza. Want to buy Pixie Scout cookies, mister? Squawk the Pixie Scout girls. Hey, sign up for pupa, fellas, says the pupae guy, whipping his clipboard. Only fifty nine ninety nine. We're 100 members strong. Our animal rights campaign is getting really aggressive. Give to our clothes drive, screeches the old man from the loyal order of the wombat. Tickets for Taco Tuesday, shrieks the fireman. I ignore them all. I'm a man with a plan. My plan is simple but brilliant. I will challenge the Grim Reaper at his own game. I will wish to be freed from his curse. I will emerge triumphant. It's the perfect strategy. Nothing can go wrong. But as we approach the metal and glass box of the game console, I realize I've been foiled by forces larger than myself. The one diabolical snag that nobody, and I mean nobody, could have predicted. There's not a order sign on the Reaper's curse. Well played, Grim Reaper. Well played. But I am not so easily daunted. I toss the sign to the ground and stare at the skeletal visage of my adversary. He stares back at me from within his glass case, empty eye sockets mocking me. I'm glad I brought backup. I turn to Darvish. Loan me another quarter. Another one, he reaches into his pocket. You need to start carrying cash. I pop the quarter into the coin slot. Nothing happens. I kick the game cabinet. Nothing. I rock it back and forth. It barely budges. Nothing lights up. Nothing moves. The Reaper just sits there, defiantly. Drumstick tugs on my pant leg. I think somebody needs to go to the bathroom on it, he suggests. That's what worked before. I'm loath to admit it, but of course the bird is right. I turn to my best friend. Darvish, being my backup is a two-pronged position. Financing our mission is only the first prong. What's the second prong? You're going to have to pee on the plug. What? He screeches higher than I realized was possible. Forget it! Pee is the only way to summon the magic, Darvish. I told you chickens don't pee, he cries. It's basic science. Birds poop and pee together. They peep. Well, I reason, unless you have peeping skills I don't know about, we're going to have to make do with you peeing on it. Make the chicken do it, he says. That's what worked last time. I look to Drumstick, but he just shrugs. I haven't gone since I died, he says. I don't think dead things have to go to the bathroom. I grab Darvish by the shoulders. Ghosts don't pee, Darvish. It's got to be you. Come on. Do you want me to be cursed forever? Darvish sulks. No. Do you want me to be haunted to the end of my days? Darvish sighs. No. Please, Darvish, you're my best friend. Can you think of anyone else more qualified to take a leak on an electrical cord of my time of need? Darvish places his bag of strawberries on the ground. I guess not. He looks around to ensure there are no bystanders to witness his shame. If this gets out, I'm never getting into the college of my choice. These things haunt your transcript forever. My best friend sidles up to the cord and makes the ultimate sacrifice. Is it working? He yells. I push buttons. I jiggle the joystick. I kick the game again. Nothing. Nothing is happening, I tell Darvish. Pee harder. I'm peeing as hard as I can, he cries. Nothing. What? He yells. Are you telling me that I'm urinating in public for nothing? It's not technically my fault, Darvish. Blame the Reaper. The Grim Reaper is playing hard to get. It's a classic move. This robotic replica of death is shrewder than I have given him credit for. And that's when it happens. Oh my gosh. That is so gross. A voice startles me. I freeze in terror. A chill ripples through me. It's the fuzz. The popo. The long arm of the law. We're caught with our pants down. Actually, nobody's pants are down. Only Darvish's zipper. Tell your friend to stop peeing in public, the voice cries. Show some respect for yourself. Sheesh! I turn toward the voice, but it's not the fuzz. It's not the popo. It's not the long arm of the law. It's a rhinoceros. A charred rhinoceros. A blackened rhinoceros. A burnt-to-a-crisp rhinoceros. This is one dead rhino. A green ghost ghoul pulls at its feet, and its dead eyes are staring right at me. Ah! I screech in terror. I stumble backward, with cat-like reflexes I try to catch myself, but this sidewalk must be faulty because I slam into the pavement, falling face-first into a bag of strawberries, the most light-hearted of all the fruits. Chapter 14. Despite all our advancements as a civilization, many facts about the natural world remain shrouded in secrecy. For example, rhinos have absolutely no regard for the amount of soot that they track into other people's homes. I know this because I have a dead rhino in my bedroom right now. 
Also, the rhino looks like a giant burnt tater tot. Upon seeing the dead rhino at Bye Bye Plaza, I decided to adopt a new and inspired strategy. I ran away. Fast. Like, scared little bunny rabbit fast. This perfectly formed strategy was foiled by forces beyond my comprehension. A maneuver so devious that nobody, and I mean nobody, could have predicted it. The rhino was simply waiting in my bedroom when we arrived. Diabolical. Why is it so cold in here? asked Darvish. I can almost see my breath. Darvish is also in my room. He sits and pants heavily. Our recent sprint has winded him. It always gets cold when they first appear, I say. I resist the urge to shiver. I refuse to give this rhino the satisfaction. And what's that black stuff all over your carpet? asked Darvish. Those are ashes, I explain, from the charbroiled rhino. Whoa! Ghost soot! He bends down to examine it. He's in here right now? You're talking to a dead rhino right now? Did he just call me a he? says the rhino. Wow. Just wow. What's the problem? I ask the rhino. Hello, I'm a girl rhino, obviously. She snaps her girl rhino fingers at Darvish. He's a she, I tell Darvish, and yes, she is standing right there. I point at the rhino, tapping her foot. You better believe I'm tapping my foot, says the rhino. I'm telling you that fire was no accident. She flounces heavily into my beanbag chair. Great. Now that has to be washed, too. She's going on about, she's going on about some fire, I tell Darvish. Drumstick flutters up to perch by my side. Fire? Fire, asks Darvish. He grabs me and shakes me. Holly Kreskin! Focus, man, I say. This is no time to be daydreaming about girls. No, he cries. Hollywood had a story in current events today. I wasn't really listening, I say. I have no interest in the babblings of a double cat owner who dislikes animals. He slaps his forehead in frustration. Clearly, he feels similarly about Holly Kreskin. Her article was about a rhino at the zoo. A rhino that was killed in a fire. Oh, yeah, I say. The pieces are all coming together. So you're saying, yes, cries Darvish, that the burnt rhino that's in my room right now, yes, exclaims Darvish, probably knows the rhino that was killed in the fire. No, cries Darvish. I'm saying she is the rhino that was killed in the fire. If that's true, why would Tater Tot be here? I ask. Who's Tater Tot? It's what I'm calling her now. I turn to Tater Tot. Why are you here? Because you can hear me. Duh, she says. I just knew you could. Don't know how, don't know why. But I've got unfinished business and I need somebody who can listen. And that's you. Unfinished business, I ask. What am I supposed to do? Something, she yells. Look, I heard somebody in my cage before the fire started. Next thing I know, I'm the only crispified citizen of Blazytown. Don't you care that there's a rhino killer on the loose? Sheesh. Sure, I care about rhino killers, I say, but you're dead now. Can't you just move on to rhino heaven and leave me alone? Yeah, squawks Drumstick. Move on to rhino heaven. You too, I shouted him. The chicken looks hurt. Why would I move on to rhino heaven? I'm a chicken. If I moved on to anywhere, shouldn't it be chicken heaven? Whatever, I say. Why involve me in any of this? Darvish stands up and starts pacing. The kid paces when he gets excited. It's a nervous habit. The rhino wants something, doesn't she? Asks Darvish. She says the fire wasn't an accident, I tell Darvish. Like I'm supposed to do something about it. I knew it. There's a reason they're coming to you. Yeah, I say, because they're annoying. Don't you see, he says. She needs something from you. His pacing has picked up speed. I've been giving this some thought. Remember what the curse said. Animals of every size will pass away, then open eyes. When death leaves questions of mystique, their spirits linger, eyelids peak. To find their answer, you they'll seek. I grab the Grim Reaper card from my dresser. He's right, word for word. Darvish really needs to get some hobbies. How in the world did you remember that? It's called reading. It's called strange, I say. Seek help. Seek help, repeats Darvish. That's exactly what they're doing. Seeking your help. I think you're supposed to help them. Help them do what? Right some wrong. They're still tethered to this world. Yeah. The rhino chimes in. I'm tethered. They need your help to finish something important before they can move on. You should listen to your little buddy, says Tater Tot. Come on, help me out. Just this last piece of unfinished business, then I'll get out of your hair. Drumstick died without a name, Darvish says. The rhino was murdered. They're coming to you because they need something. They need you to help them. But I gave the chicken a name, I say. Why is he still here? I don't know. Maybe he's here to help you. Maybe he's too dumb to know he's dead. Maybe he just really likes you. Drumstick nods. Those are all excellent theories. Ooh, look, a chocolate chip. He starts pecking at the folds of my bed sheets. Give me a big, fat break. It's not my fault. Somebody put a neon sign over my head that only the recently deceased members of the animal kingdom can see. Now I'm supposed to play camp council with every dead critter that limps into my room? Even in death, animals find me irresistible. Being popular is a burden. Chapter 15. Another Wednesday has dawned. Which means, in addition to my many other troubles, I will go hungry today. Because nothing, and I mean nothing, can compel me to put beef rooney into my body. Beefaroonie is the mixed-breed mud of school lunches. It is a travesty of colossal proportions wrapped in a veil of tomato sauce and guile. Plus, I'm unclear on the rules of what dead animals are going to show up next, but until I am, I'm on a strict diet of items that were not formerly alive, mostly Doritos and Mountain Dew. Last thing I need is some beefaroonie cow showing up and getting its ghost gunk on my bed sheets. Apparently, my dead chicken and dead rhino compatriots do not care about such matters, because they are scarfing the beefaroonie from my lunch tray with verve. 
Please quit touching stuff, I hiss at them. You're going to attract unwanted attention. But they don't. It is possible I'm the only one that can see them scarfing my lunch in plain sight. Even Darvish does not seem to notice. Darvish shakes his brown paper bag at me and smiles. Why don't you just bring your lunch from home on Wednesdays, he asks me. Because that's what they want, I reply. I'm not a stooge of the system. He's eating crackers of some type of beige goo. Hummus, I believe. I'm not sure. I am not versed in the goo-shaped food products our generation so relishes. If you say so, he says. Any new ideas about the dead rhino mystery? That's a fair question, says Tater Tot between mouthfuls. You making any progress on my case or what? I ignore the rhino and roll my eyes at Darvish. Me? I scold. As my loyal sidekick, it is your job to brainstorm solutions while I am otherwise engaged. I am not your sidekick, he says. My sidekick is mouthy sometimes. It is adorable. He looks at my half-eaten entree. I thought you hated beefaroonie. I am about to explain how beefaroonie is a black mark on the nutritional standards of our nation, how this blight on our health and taste buds may well be grounds for legal action against the Department of Education, and how my ghostly companions do not seem to care. But before I can explain the mystery of the vanishing beefaroonie, I am interrupted by Edwin Willoughby. As you probably already know, Edwin Willoughby is the kid in my class who can touch his elbow with his tongue. He is pretty much world famous for this skill. That and his pit bull named Alfred make him A-OK in my book. Hey, Darvish, he says. Can I borrow your math notes? Darvish shrugs and eats another cracker. I no longer take notes. Um, what? Says Edwin Willoughby. Instead of taking notes, explains Darvish, I use this. He extracts something long and thin from his shirt pocket. That's a pen, says Edwin Willoughby. No, it's not, says Darvish. Oh, man, give me a break! <sighs> Edwin sighs and looks to the heavens, which is distressing, because he has clearly eaten the beefaroonie. The early symptoms of gastric distress are making themselves known. It's not a pen, asks Edwin. I admire his persistence in the face of beefaroonie-induced anguish. No, insists Darvish, it is a spy pen, with built-in ultrasonic recording capability. Oh, says Edwin Willoughby. I now record Miss Yardley's lessons for future playback instead of taking notes. Why do you do that? asks Edwin Willoughby. Darvish pulls a banana from his lunch sack. He begins peeling it. Because there is a student who sits near me who talks too much. A student who gets me in trouble with constant chattering. A student who makes it impossible for me to take notes. I nod my head in understanding. It is kind of him not to name names mixed company, but it doesn't take a rocket science to know he's talking about Sammy Mulpepper. That girl is quite the chatterbox. Edwin rubs his face with his palm in frustration. Uh-oh. The beef rooney sweats have begun. Okay, then, he says, gritting his teeth. Can I borrow your spy pen with built-in ultrasonic recording capability? Darvish reluctantly surrenders the device to Edwin Willoughby. Fine, he says. Just give it back by the end of the day. Edwin Willoughby snatches the contraption and walks away. Darvish looks at me. Did you figure out which student I was talking about? I give him a knowing smile. I'm way ahead of you, buddy. He chooses banana. His eyes fall to my lunch tray. Hey, good for you, he says. You finished your lunch. I look to my now empty tray. I didn't need it. Okay, says Darvish. It's pointless to argue. I look to my right where Drumstick and Tater Tot sit. That's some of the best rhino chow I've had in ages. Tater Tot licks her mouth. Me too, squawks the chicken. He rubs his stomach with his flattened flipper-like wings. They clearly don't know what they're saying. It's obvious beefaroonie delirium has started to set in. Even the dead are not immune. Chapter 16 I feel quite certain that if I could find a moment's peace, I could figure out Tater Tot's ghostly afterlife dilemma lickety-split, but there are a multitude of interruptions continually vying for my attention. 1. My teacher's ongoing attempts to educate me. She never seems to tire of it. 2. An oral research report that looms over me like a specter. 3. Constantly fending off hugs from an overly affectionate dead chicken. 4. Cleaning up soot stains left behind by a crispy rhinoceros. 5. Spoon-feeding suggestions for improved sidekicking techniques to Darvish. The demands of my time are endless. I can't concentrate. I can't get a moment to myself. I fear there is no lickety split to be found, which means no solution for my newly deceased animal companions, which would be a bummer for them and for me. Luckily for me, I have a secret hideout that nobody can infiltrate. It is called the shower. Nobody dares disturb me here because they recognize the sanctity of this place, because they acknowledge the privacy and respect that is due this watery fortress of solitude. Also, because I am naked. This Grim Reaper character has done a number on me. He has cursed me into being a conduit for recently deceased animals and unfinished business. It seems these spirits know right where to find me. I wonder if there are others with this ability, and if so, do they also use the shower as a retreat from the undead? And if so, what kind of madness is this wreaking on their water bill? So many unanswered questions. I try to clear my head as the scene rises around me. According to Darvish's theory, Tater Tot has come to me for a reason. She claims that the fire was set on purpose. She postulates that she heard somebody in the rhino enclosure right before the fire began. Somebody with foul intent. Apparently, if I simply solve the rhino's murder, her unfinished business in the mortal world will be resolved, and she will move on to a better place, like heaven, or Valhalla, or Cleveland, anywhere but here. It is time to get organized. It is time to put my agile brain to the task. Perhaps if I list all the clues, the solution will make itself known. Clue number one, a rhino is dead. Clue number two, I have no clues beyond this. 
It is possible there are forces at work that are stopping my agile brain from functioning at its best. I blame the beefaroonie. Even though I didn't need it, perhaps just being around it has had a vicarious dumbing down effect on me. From now on, I shall call this effect beefaroonie brain. It is unclear if beefaroonie brain is a real thing or a figment of my overworked imagination. What is clear is that I am no closer to a solution than when I started this shower. My fingers are pruned up and I have nothing to show for it. It is possible that this rhino will never get to Cleveland now. In the middle of these depressing thoughts, I feel it. A cold tingle that starts at the base of my spine and moves up from there. In spite of the warm water, the hairs on my arms stand on end. I feel unknown eyes watching me. I am not alone. I turn and see it. A sinister shadow looms against my shower curtain. A hairy black hand reaches out and yanks the curtain aside. Ah! I scream and shield my eyes from what I feel is certain doom. You've been in there for weeks, says a deep voice. Are you planning to emerge sometime this century? I need a little help out here if you don't mind. I open my eyes and I see it. It is not certain doom. It is a gorilla. It looks like this. As you can see, it is completely soaked from head to toe. It has a large shark clamped onto its butt. Green mists swirls at its feet. It is looking expectantly at me. And while live gorillas with live sharks chewing on their butts and green mists swirling up their feet may be commonplace in more savvy and cultured parts of the country, like Cleveland, in the bathrooms of Middling Falls they are rare. Which can only mean one thing. This gorilla is dead, and so is the shark. It also means one other thing. They have no regard for the sanctity of this space, for the privacy and respect that is due this watery fortress of solitude, or for the fact that I am naked! Chapter 17. We are at the zoo, eating snow cones. This is yummy, says Drumstick, scarfing his blue raspberry snow cone enthusiastically. The rhino nods. It is quite the tasty treat. You think this tastes good, snorts the gorilla. I once climbed for three solid months to eat snow from the frost-shuttered peaks of Mount Karasimbi. It tasted like world peace, drizzled with honey and sprinkles. This is nothing. The snow cone guy looked at me funny when I ordered four snow cones, but if I cared what people thought of me, I wouldn't be where I am today. Which is at the zoo. Dad dropped me off. He seemed pleased that I had taken an interest in learning about animals, if he only knew. Plus, the gorilla left a puddle of water on the bathroom floor, and I got the blame for it, so I think my dad was happy to have me out of the house. The gorilla. He tried to explain his predicament to me. The shark did, too, but it was hard to understand him with a mouthful of gorilla butt, so their story was a bit confusing. That's when I called Darvish, because he speaks confusing quite fluently, but he didn't answer his phone. Which is rude, if you ask me. When a dead gorilla interrupts your best friend's shower, you pick up the phone. I decided I needed visual inspiration, and what better inspiration than where it all happened, which is at the zoo. I suspect that the antidote to my beefaroony brain is kiwi lime snow cone, because I am clear-headed at last. Clear-headed enough to remember that I am a bad of big, bold moves. Clear-headed enough to realize that sticking out the scene of the crime is my next big, bold move. Let's take a closer look at that gorilla house, I say. Only, there is a problem at the scene of the crime. Part of the zoo has been roped off. The rhinoceros exhibit is closed, and the gorilla house is closed, and the oceanarium is closed. The universe is conspiring against my big, bold moves. But I'm here on semi-official business, so I ignore the ropes. Hey, kid, you can't be back here. It is a big, bold security guard. He is big in girth rather than height, likely owing to a steady diet of corn dogs and funnel cakes. He is bold because he is standing in the way of my semi-official authority. Back behind the rope, kid, he says, pointing. What's going on, I ask. None of your beeswax, he says. That's what. This is discrimination, I say. I'm being oppressed under the thumb of the man. What man, he asks. You, I explain. Where were you on the night in question? He rubs the temples of his balloon-shaped head. Probably here not making enough money for this nonsense. I make a mental note on the suspicious character. Guard too pudgy to commit murder. But I stand my ground. My taxes pay for this zoo, I say. You work for me, good sir. As such, I will thank you kindly to heed my authority in this matter. He does not heed my authority in this matter. Instead, he escorts me by the arm and returns me to the safety of the snow cone stand. I'm pretty sure little kids don't pay taxes, he says. Plus, taxes don't pay for the zoo. Admission prices do. He waddles back to his ropes with a huff. Curses. This is all Darvish's fault. If he were here, he could probably jury-rig some sort of explosion to distract the guard. It's dangerous work, but I'd be willing to sacrifice him to the cause. I could then slip by unnoticed on nimble cat paws. Instead, I've been fast-talked and manhandled by the short, rotund arm of the law, which means we can't get anywhere near the actual scene of the crime. And the zoo closes in an hour, which means we are running out of time. Plus, Tater Tot wants another snow cone. I'm getting a headache, I mutter, rubbing my eyes. Quit being a baby, says the gorilla, thumping his chest for emphasis. I once got hit in the head with 47 coconuts. Not regular coconuts, mind you. Coconuts from a rare breed of acid coconut tree. I barely felt the thing. The shark rolls his eyes. This gorilla has proved to be just as obnoxious as the rhino in his own special way. I take a deep breath. Okay, I say. <sighs> Tell me again how you got out of the gorilla house and how you wound up with a shark nibbling your bottom. It wasn't my fault, the gorilla says, furrowing his thick brow. Somebody opened my cage. 
I'm telling you, there are sinister workings afoot, chimes in Tater Tot. Somebody's out to get us. You said somebody set that fire, I confirm. Uh, yeah, she says, tapping her foot. Somebody sinister. That fire killed me completely dead. I turn to the gorilla. And you were killed by a shark? He turns around to reveal the shark chewing noisily on his hindquarters. This? This is nothing. I once had a panther chew off my whole leg. I beat the panther to a pulp, crawled inside his stomach, retrieved my leg, and sewed it back on with nothing but vines. The shark mumbles. It did to happen, the gorilla tells the shark. It happened on several different occasions. I shake my head. So, how did you die? I drowned, he says. Not my fault I can't swim. But how? Not my fault. Somebody opened my cage. Look, we've established that. Look here, you little, he starts. Tater Tot steps up to the gorilla, towering over him like a small pointy-nosed mountain. Sheesh, dial it down a notch. Rexy is trying to get the facts straight. There's no cause to get huffy. Yeah, squawks drumstick. Don't be huffy to Rexy. Yeah, I murmur. Rexy. The gorilla backs off. Okay, sorry. Dying takes a lot out of you. He blows out his cheeks and presses his knuckle to the ground. I'll start at the beginning. I've never been outside my enclosure, right? Not since I was first brought to this place from the wild. So when somebody opened up the door, I went out. I'm curious by nature, okay? And when I came to the oceanarium display, I went inside. And you fell into the shark tank, I ask? <laughs> Gurgles the shark. The water look refreshing, says the gorilla. What can I say? I am a sucker for refreshing looking water. And the shark attacked you and tried to kill you? He wishes, <laughs> snorts the gorilla. One time, I got stampeded by a herd of wildebeest, while the wildebeest were being stampeded by a herd of elephants, while the elephants were being chased by a pack of wild dogs. Nobody survived except me. That seems made up, I say. Another time, I fell a thousand feet off a cliff while wrestling a crocodile and used the crocodile's mouth as a parachute to land safely at the bottom. This shark is nothing, he points to the shark. See how that bruising around the snout? That's all me. I gave him a good pummeling, I did. Work, says the shark around a snout full of apiney. Fine, I say. And while you were pummeling the shark to death, you drowned. The gorilla nods. Yeah, but it's not my fault, is it? Somebody opened my cage. This ape is holding out. Time to ask the hard questions. I look him sternly in the eye. Do you or the shark owe anybody money? He looks confused. My best friend asked you a question, chimes in Drumstick. His beak has turned raspberry blue. The gorilla shrugs. What's money? I keep the pressure on. Does anybody owe you money? Once again, he claims to have no working knowledge of basic currency. I throw my hands up in exasperation. Can either of you think of anybody who would want you out of the way, I ask. Obviously, somebody who hates animals, says Tater Tot. What other possible reason could there be to make all this disappear? She holds her rhino arms out and twirls in a circle. Look at me. I'm a rare beauty. You think you're rare, pipes up the gorilla. I'm so rare, I am practically extinct. There's less than one of me left in existence. I know saber-toothed tigers that are more common than I am. I sit down in defeat and finish my snow cone. It tastes like kiwi lime and failure. I'm astute enough to realize that my clue hunting trip to the zoo is a bust. How could Darvish not answer his phone? Because I really need an explosive expert right about now. And a best friend.